Right, let's turn our attention to uh, Gaelic Games. Conor McKeown is with us this morning to look back at some of the county final action over the course of the weekend and uh, obviously cast an eye forward to what we hope is the return of the championship. Uh, Conor, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Good, yeah, good. Um, maybe we'll start with Ballymun's dominant performance against Bally Bowden. Um, I, I, I thought that in the build-up to this game, people were kind of expecting it to maybe be close with one team coming out is in Ballymun, but not a, not the absolute hammering that they handed out. What happened here? I don't know. Like that would have been the general uh, the, the, the general thinking going into the final. Like Ballyboden weren't just Dublin champions; they were Leinster champions as well. And you know, this was a Dublin championship where there were three teams from early on from the group stages that showed like, sort of serious scoring form: Ballymun, Ballyboden, and Kilmacook Croaks. And you sort of had a feeling that they'd all be in the mix. And the fact that with Ballymun and Ballyboden in the final was no surprise to anybody. I think it does, it does, there's, there's a bit of the Ballyboden performance, I think, was probably taken away by the fact that, you know, I don't think Collie Baskell was fit. I don't think Michael Darren McCauley was 100%. I don't think Aaron Waters was probably fit. Um, and their goalkeeper, Dara Gogan, was suspended as well. But, like, I mean, to be honest with you, like, I think all the planets just aligned yesterday for Ballymoon. Like that theory that's been doing the rounds about them for the last few years that they've paid the price for having so many players in the Dublin panel. And, you know, when they come back to the Ballymoon squad after the All Ireland series is over, they're kind of tired and injured and unfamiliar with the rest of the team and how they're supposed to play. I think that basically should just checked out this year. You know, but we, we got to see what Ballymoon would be like with full preparation and full access to their Dublin players. And, um, sort of, you know, yesterday and over the course of the championship, they sort of demonstrated that that's sort of quite a prospect that they have. It turns out that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's bang on. Because even if you go through it, okay, like they blitzed the group. In the quarterfinal, they played Nafina, who knocked them out last year um, and like beat them well last year on a night when sort of everything went wrong. All the Dublin players looked like they were sort of, you know, running backwards nearly, like they were so tired and... You know, they beat the Fina by after being five points down at half time, and then in the semi final, they beat Croaks, who were champions two years ago. And here they, they got, you know, to my memory, the best performance of a team in the Dublin senior football final for 15 years, anyway. Um, you know, it just all came together for them yesterday. And like the other issue that Ballymun have had over the years um, was, you know, sometimes in big games, they might lose their discipline. And, you know, sometimes that, that doesn't mean kind of getting sent off, but it means losing your tactical discipline, you know. When the pressure came on, they kind of went away from the thing that served them so well. But everything about the performance was yesterday was brilliant. Like, they were just absolutely relentless. Um, it was, it was <laughs> you know, it wasn't... On paper, it should have been a great weekend for... for um, TV GAA because we had the Kerry Senior Football Final, a Kilkenny Senior Hurling Final and a Dublin Senior Football Final but actually I think the Cavan game was the pick of the games in terms of competitiveness because this was another one of those county finals that just one team got on top and absolutely kind of hammered home their advantage to the final whistle and you know after I think Bally Bowden had gone 40 minutes without scoring and they were well and truly beaten and I just it was one of those hits that John Small put on Connell Keeney and you just looked like you know the game was over at that stage and you just knew that Ballymun weren't going to let up and um, you know they just won nearly every battle you know they were they were really brilliant yesterday and it was, it, like it's been a long time coming it's it's eight years since they last won a Dublin title and they definitely should have collected one or two more along the way but you know I think yesterday definitely put that theory to bed you know when they do have all their Dublin players around um, they're a different proposition entirely. Um, Owen, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, Kerry final uh, as well. That was, again, so if anybody was unfamiliar with what happened over the weekend, Ballymone Kickham's beat Ballyboden St. Enders 119 to 8 points in the Dublin final. In the Kerry final, it was East Kerry against Mid Kerry. East Kerry uh, beat Mid Kerry 215 to 9 points. I, the thing we should say in all these, Dean Rock sure, yeah. was on fire, scored 1 8. What did Clifford score, apart from scoring a wonder goal? Clifford scored. You're putting me on the spot here. Sorry. Uh, was it, uh, was, I, I'll get it here in a sec. Was it's it one, one four, five? I think. One, one four. four. One four. Right. Um, yeah, and obviously the 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 one part of that was just ridiculous. To be honest, I mean they they made the decision to not give the game to RTE and stream it instead. And I think they was it more expensive. I think maybe again it was a fiver during the rest of the championship, and then it would have cost you a tenner to watch Saturday. And I think everybody just paid for Clifford alone and. Like I mean, that paid off 
handsomely that decision with uh, that goal. I think more people are going to end up seeing that goal anyway because of the amount of people, including myself, who would have filmed it and put it up online anyway. But it was just like it was just a ridiculous uh, effort. Te- all technically, together. that's pirating that you've just admitted to on. But anyway, keep going. <laughs> it's like I, I don't know. It's I, it's, it's kind of hard to, to to think where this sort of is in terms of like uh, final moments and. I guess moments of audacity in a final to actually have the cheat to do that when you've got somebody like Peter Crowley of all people bearing down on him and that's the one thing that's kind of been I, I think overlooked a little bit in all of this that you've got a few people on Twitter saying yeah but where was the marking and all that sort of stuff it's kind of like you can criticise the marking but it's like Peter Crowley was the guy marking him I mean there aren't too many more experienced defenders in Kerry at the moment and uh, particularly at club level he's as good as you're likely to get anywhere in the country so uh, I think that probably almost puts the cherry on it a little bit. Um, can I, before we talk about the, the relative strengths of the teams that we're seeing at the moment, Connor, one of the, the overarching GA conversations at the moment is the the way that we're hurtling towards a split season. If we do hurtle towards a split season, how long would there be for Interprovincial and All Ireland Club Championships to take place. So, does everything have to get pushed back this this year? Obviously, there's no interprovincial, and, and we can talk about that in a minute as well. But, um, so it's, you'd have to have your county finals done, and then you'd still need another seven or eight weeks to roll off the interprovincials in the All Irelands, or does it get telescoped much quicker? Yeah, I think they'll probably end up rattling through it much quicker, um, because you'll have certainty now. You'll have certainty of start dates, which is the big issue, um, with. Uh, provincial championships over the years um, like a couple of years ago they took a move to get away from replays um, in club championships so you know that obviously takes a few weekends off so no I think it'll be quite neat and it'll be quite condensed you might have a situation where all Ireland club finals are going to be played in the first week of December the second week of December but you know like like let's face it the first week in December, the second week of December, will be preferable weather conditions to St. Patrick's Day, you know, frequently because mm. of sort of the way this climate is. So, no, I don't think that would be a big issue. And just on that point, like I, like I saw a couple of people, I think Tim Crow, the manager of Six Mile Bridge, brought it up yesterday. Um, and I know uh, Willie Marr, the Pakula manager, brought it up last week. Um, but I think there, there is a bit of a groundswell at the moment um, amongst clubs who have obviously won their county championship to see can they get this staged because at the moment the, the, you know this year's provincial championships uh, and the All Ireland series even if it has to be done well it does have to be done early next year um, because we haven't seen anything from Crow Park yet with regards to what the 2021 season is going to look like um, you know we know it's going to be condensed in some form or other but it would look as though it's certainly not going to start as early in the new year. The intercounty part of that, as we have done in the past few years, to give everybody a break after this championship that's about to start. So I just wonder whether, um, you know, if there's enough of a groundswell of opinion. Um, considering you're you're dealing with a limited number of clubs, you're basically dealing with a football champion and a hurling champion in each county. Um, you know whether that could possibly go ahead because I think you could probably get it played off in six weeks. And if you know if teams are willing to go back. Uh, club teams who haven't played in a couple of months, you know, if they're willing to go back early in the new year, like the Ballyboden Kilku, the All Ireland football semi finals of this year, I think, were played on the 3rd or 4th of January. So, you know, I think if teams are willing to go back at that stage and, and we're in a situation where, you know, counties aren't sort of in a lockdown, you know, I, I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility that uh, the Crow Park might uh, accede to such a request. So they would revisit that and, and maybe reopen the whole notion of an interprovincial. So, I mean, that's something for clubs to bear in mind a little bit over the next few weeks? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, I, I just know from being at county finals, um, you know, in the last couple of weeks, there has been a small, you know, like I think it's a credit to the players that the standard of the play has been so high, you know, regardless of the atmosphere in which the games are being played, you know, like it's, you know, that that's definitely noticeable that once the ball gets thrown in, the crowd doesn't actually seem to be a factor. But there's definitely... A massive come down after the final whistle, you know, after that initial period of euphoria, you know, there's no there's no supporters to kind of sustain the celebrations, and then you can see with clubs, you know, you know, there's a lot of big ambitious clubs are winning county titles this year, uh, you know, teams like Ballymoan, Kula, Nipirsig, um, you know, Six Mile Bridge, we're in the like, you know, teams that are multiple champions now at this stage, and you know, a lot of those clubs would have looked further down the tracks beyond just winning their county I think a lot of them would have had ambitions to win their province uh, and go on and win in All-Ireland so I just think if enough of them get together um, and we have this period early in the new year where there's no county games um, 
fuck, I, I don't see a good reason not to do it, I suppose. Uh, Connor, just to go back to the Dublin final, one of the concerns maybe some people had over the fact that you couldn't go back training with your county team before whatever date it was in September was that the level of training you might get might be a level below what you'd be getting at inter-county level. Uh, from what we've seen from the Dublin clubs over the last little while, are they operating off a very high level in comparison to clubs in different parts of the country? Well, I think if you were to do, like if there was some way to rank the, the football teams in Ireland, the football clubs in Ireland, um, you know, I, I definitely think three of the top ten would be from Dublin. So, you know, you have a very high standard there. Um, but what drove that up in the past, it's it's kind of funny, um, what drove that up in the past was the fact that you would have players from outside of Dublin playing with the big Dublin clubs. Um, and so, you know, to get onto your county team or to get onto your senior club team, you'd have to be training to a very high standard. But, um, you know, there was a guy, James Burke, who's actually a member of uh, James Horan's Mayo management team who was on the bench yesterday for Bally Bowden, but he was the only player not not from Dublin. So um, a lot of the big Dublin clubs now are, are kind of very, very homegrown. Um, and like, you know, we saw Curra Finn losing yesterday, but I think, you know, if you were doing a top 10 clubs in club football team in Ireland at the moment, um, I definitely think three of them would be from Dublin anyway. I think Kimbaco Croaks, Bally Moan, and Bally Bowden would be there. Um, so they have a look there's, ju there's just a very very high standard I think it's one of those sort of rising tide lifts all boats you know Dublin underage teams are strong at the moment Dublin senior team is strong at the moment um, you know and certainly a Dublin club with six or seven county panellists on a, on a team that's winning five all Ireland's in a row they're inevitably going to be strong so I think we probably saw the full the full strength of Dublin clubs this year because the, the county season wasn't such a factor or wasn't a factor at all Who's put their hand up for Dublin during the course of this club campaign? Obviously, it's been a very, very long off-season with relatively new management, so it could be ripe for an opportunity for somebody new to come into that camp. Yeah, it's funny. I, I'm not sure that there, there will be on this year right. just because of the circumstances. Just it, like It's not that there aren't players that are showing form. There are. But I think because Desi Farrell was so late into his appointment and because he had such limited exposure to the squad before they were all told to break up. And because he has such a limited um, lead in time now to the championship, you know, if you have a squad of players like he does that are tried and, and tested and, and proven, and because of the system whereby, you know, you have to probably, like, let's, you know, cards on the table here, we all expect Dublin to win Leinster. So, you know, there's two big games for him to win in All-Ireland. I, I think his tendency for this year will be to go back to the tried and trusted Um and, and go with what has worked in the past because a lot of those players have had a serious rest now. Like, you know, like the fellow like Keno Sullivan hasn't played an inter county match in 14 months or whatever it is, um, you know. So, like, you know, fellas who you'd be looking at over the last couple of years saying, well, you know, can they get through another inter county season? You know, you know, how's the body going to hold up? Um, they should be actually in, in better condition going into this championship than they would have been had it started on time. So, like there, are, there are a couple, like Robbie McDade, I thought was the best player, the, the Bally Bowden defenders, I thought he was the best player in the entire championship going into the county final. Um, and he has been in the squad. So like probably what you'll see is not some guy coming from left field, but somebody who was maybe outside the 26 on match days for the last couple of years has found enough form to, to justify getting into the team. But, you know, if you were Desi Farrell, I suppose look, you have to look at it and say that the defence is getting older. You know, that is the area of the team where Dublin need new blood. So... You know, if we don't see it this year, I would certainly expect to see a raft of young defenders maybe kind of come into the squad and 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 test it out in next year's league. But you know, mm. I th I think in the short term, given the way this championship is going to play, I think it, it's just too risky. I think you know you'll go back to your Keno Sullivan's and and Philly McMahon's an awful lot quicker than you'll throw somebody in from the blue. But the thing is, the point you're making there is that your Keno Sullivan's, your Philly McMahon's, your Johnny Coopers, that they're all so rested up at this point if there is one bunch of players who are likely to have taken advantage of this layoff to have utilized the resources at their disposal to get their body into the right nick it's those sort of players like do you put Dermot Connolly into that mix of somebody who might come back as a, a rejuvenated figure as somebody who can make a big difference this year as well yeah I did and then um like he, he I think he got his longest run of club games in about two or three years with Vincent's early in the year and he was starting to show really good form and then he basically he, he basically missed um, he missed the game that they were knocked out uh, in the quarter final. Um, he only came on for the last fifteen minutes of that game, 
um, with a hamstring in, or I think it was, I don't know, it was an upper tire, upper quad injury. So, yeah, right. it's funny with Connolly because, you know, for the last few years, he's been fully fit, but, you know, not around. And now he's around, uh, but I think he's probably had a couple of small injuries in the last couple of years. But, um, yeah, like his form is good enough. And I think, if, you know, if, if he's in the, if he's in the headspace to kind of give it a crack with Dublin this year, he's definitely going to be a factor, you know, because, you know, you, you know, Dublin have lost a bit of experience, you know, through fellas like Bernard Brogan and Darren Daly, like fellas who are who are kind of keeping standards high in training. And I think for Desi Farrell, you know, it comes back to the last point. You know, you want to have as many of those guys around who have been involved in the five in a row as possible, just to make sure that the standards are maintained for this year. Um, you know, whatever sort of snipping and pruning has to be done in the squad, I think will probably be done next year. Um, and so long as Connolly is available, I think he'll definitely be part of it. Yeah, it's like, I mean, some sort of zombified version of Dublin we're looking at here, where they're coming back stronger than ever. People that we thought were done, back from the dead, and uh, it's uh, going to be the, the easiest all Ireland ever is what I'm hearing. Well, no, isn't it, isn't it actually going to be the <laughs> under-21s who end up get the like, Desi's under-21s who benefit most from the fact that, like, he will have some familiarity with them and he'll know exactly what jobs they can do. And they'll have had, I think, the whole kind of summer to bulk up and to get to a point where they're physically ready for this. Plus, in winter, don't you want pace and, and players who are light on the ground as opposed to the kind of the big lads, I think. Yeah, yeah. but the other thing is, you know, like you're talking about instilling a game plan and a system, you know, like Desi has, has had such limited exposure to that group of players um, that starting from scratch isn't really an option now, you know. So that's why I, I really do think he's going to go with the tried and tested and experienced. Like he tried a lot of players out in the league, um, and I think had the league continued at that point and gone straight into a Leinster Championship, we would have had a higher number of new players in the Dublin team in the Championship than we will have now in the in the current situation. It, you know that. You know I think if you go away from the team that won five All Irelands in a row and you don't win, um, you know you're kind of you're kind of uh, leaving yourself open. But like Desi Farr was at, I think, all of those games um, and he was keeping a very, very close eye on all the players. And he'd be, I think, you know, even, you know, you got the impression with Jim Gavin with the last couple of years, he knew what he could get from those players. Um, you know, he wasn't even kind of looking at them. Whereas I think, you know, Desi would have had a very analytical eye on these players, even guys who've been around for 10, 12 years and have won <clears throat> six or seven All-Irelands. And, um, you know, you know, if, if they're informant or fully fit, It'd be very hard not to pick them. Oh, and go on, try, try and yarrow away, Kerry's all Ireland chances there. I, I interrupted you, sorry. I realise <laughs> retrospectively that's what you're to. doing. No, I think the, the, the case for, for Dublin's March to six has been well and truly uh, outlined there by Connor. No, no yarrowing needed when, those are the can when that is the candidate, the, the strength of the candidate is already leading the way. Can I just make a point on Clifford's goal, by the way, seeing as we've gone away from it a bit quickly? Uh, there was a. There was a I saw there was a few people uh, um, saying, well, you know, how good really was it? You know, how many goals do we see scored in, in soccer the whole time um, from outside the box and from a similar range? But, uh, like, the, 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 the power that he generated when he turned and to kick it out of his hand, I thought was absolutely extraordinary. And given that the, the GAA ball is heavier than, uh, you know, a soccer ball, I think by nearly 20%, and the fact that the goalposts uh, are significantly um, narrower than a soccer goalpost, to be able to s sh take that shot, and the goalkeeper didn't even move. Like, I thought it was an incredible strike. Like, I thought it was an extraordinary mm. goal. Um, and it was just a shame that all the footage that came out of it was kind of grainy footage, such as Owens from his mobile phone, pirating <laughs> it off, the, <laughs> pirating it off the, the web. But, um, like, you know, I, I think uh, as highlights go of the, the club championship so far, that was definitely up there for me. I thought it was... Uh, the audacity of it, of him to take it on and the, to be able to generate that power and finish it so precisely into the top corner, I thought was incredible. Because there it definitely seems to have been a move in recent years where I, I think Dublin and Fairness have been at the, the forefront of this as well, where I guess players have been encouraged to take that risk a little bit more. Of course, taking that risk is a little bit ridiculous for most players to actually have a pop from 21 metres is, is not ideal. But anywhere within 15 yards, it's kind of like, go for the juggler here, try and go for the back of the net, try and get the three points because the the upshot here is just something far bigger than trying to, to tap over points. It's kind of like the, the move they've made almost the three pointers all the time in, in the NBA, but I, I still think it's uh, absolutely obscene what he did and it's almost the audacity that is the most impressive thing considering it was such an easy tap over point to actually think to himself, nah, I, I want more here. 
Yeah, well, I think himself and Con O'Callaghan are going to be very interested to watch over the next seven or eight years. I think they are the two outstanding forwards in the country and they're very, very young. Um, and whereas, OK, Clifford has that ability to take that shot from that distance, I think Con O'Callaghan has that ability to <laughs> never accept the points until it's uh, you know the only possible outcome. He'll turn and he'll run at his man and try and, and open up goals. So, yeah, like, you know, I, I saw there was a bit of criticism of of uh, Mid Kerry that they didn't double mark Clifford, and I suppose that's what happens when you don't, because um, you know Crowley was standing in a position that they were expecting the long ball in over his head, and he was making sure that he was going to break it away from him. But when the ball is played out in front like that, and uh, he gets it first, you know his ability to turn and snap off a shot like that, I think, is phenomenal. Is yeah. um, is is Khan fit at the moment? Is he fully fit? Yeah, he played for Cooley yesterday in the the B football final, and they they won the senior two final, but. You know, won't have gotten promotion because there was no promotion and relegation in this year's championship. And he played for the hurlers last week in the county final. Now he was um, he was well marshalled in that game, but you know he did a great game for the for the hurlers in the county semi final two weeks previous to that. So he's played four games on four consecutive weekends. So um, you know, if he's not fit, he's uh, he's hiding it very well. Yeah. Okay, that's good. And uh, oh, and what like realistically, what is the where are Kerry at the moment? What is the chatter amongst the uh, Kerry Mafia WhatsApp group? <laughs> there's, like, there's, there's, there's been a few whispers about new, new players coming in and uh, players coming out and potential in injury worries for players but it's very, like nobody really kind of knows to be to be honest like uh, there's no inside information coming from training that much the best information we have is actually paying for the stream and watching the club games over the last little while and I think everybody saw Clifford at the weekend that he's operating at that level like I, I put that that uh, question to you Connor, kind of like about the Dublin club championship about how the le level of coaching is so good in Dublin that that might give them an added boost ahead of the championship that they come off such a, a high level compared with other counties I think Kerry are in a similar position because of the divisional sides that mm. uh, David Clifford is, is playing with much stronger teammates than he would be if he had to play with just his junior club all the time and I think that that's a that's a big thing um like one other thing just from the, the weekend that we should probably chat about, Connor, is uh, the defeat of Curfin. Like, this is a, an unbelievable record that they had struck up 49 games unbeaten over the last eight years in, in Galway football. One of the great sides, possibly the best club football side we've seen, and then get beaten fairly comprehensively yesterday by Mount Belly and Moylock. Yeah, no, like again, I just saw the result, and I think Curfin are one of those club sides that kind of. Um, you know, you have to probably go back to Cross McGlenn at the turn of the century um, for a team that has attracted so much, not just success, but I think admiration as well for the way that they play. Um, like, uh, you know, t like, t like to keep winning over the, the expanse of it. Like, if you think about the club season, like you're starting, like, okay, until this year you were starting your county championship in, in September, uh, you were winning in October. You were playing games and in, in, like I was at their, um, I was at their Connacht final last year in Tume in mid December, and you're just thinking, okay, like they're, you know, yes, they're a serious football team, but on a night, on a day like today, with the conditions the way they are, surely it's the great, um, surely it's the great equaliser, and they found a way to win all those games when they couldn't fully express themselves, and then mm. when they got out to Crow Park, they were just phenomenal to watch, and I think that's been the biggest thing about Curafin and and I think why it'll be sort of remembered um for so long, even if they don't come back and have another kind of a second uh, generation of success, it's because of the way they played the game. You know, when they ran the ball, they ran it with such purpose and they they had so many sort of intelligent little moves that came off the whole time. So yeah, like it is a huge surprise to see them beaten, but you know, uh, you know, like it it does come for everybody at the moment. I think Bally Hale mm. are probably entering the zone that Corfin were in two years ago, where where they just couldn't lose, and they're so far ahead of everybody else. And like you know, the day will come when they lose as well, but it doesn't look like it's going to be for the moment. But yeah, like it, I, I was actually talking to somebody yesterday, and uh, just after the Ballymun game, and they they were kind of saying, "Look, this Ballymun team could go really far if there was a club championship." And I said, "Well, yeah, you know, other than Cora Finn, it's hard to see where, um, from what I've seen, who's going to beat them." And then the result came through that Cora Finn were beaten. So, you know, it remains to be seen whether it's kind of the end of an era or it's just, you know, they're taking a break for this year. It's you definitely wouldn't be surprised if you saw them coming back over the next couple of years to win again, albeit, you know, some of their some of their older players are getting to the bracket now where they mightn't be as influential. So, um, 
Yeah, like yeah. it was a, it was obviously a very very significant result because I don't think um, I don't think too many predict people predicted it before it happened. Yeah, and I guess it's sometimes been a little bit of a disconnect between Curfin and Galway over recent years. Like thinking to ourselves, why aren't Galway playing that brand of football that Curfin are playing or having the same level of success? So I I wonder if the club championship this year is going to just be unbelievably instructive for the inter-county championship and the sort of individual performances that we've already mentioned. Like, you're seeing them in other places as well, like in Cork over the course of the weekend, Luke Connolly scored 3-3 in a match for Nemo Rangers. If you didn't see David Clifford's goal, then you should see Michael Quinlivan's goal for yeah. Clonmel over the course of the weekend. Absolutely outrageous. It's, it's really exciting that we're actually... Like, with all due respect to the club, we're actually talking about this in a sort of meaningful way that means we actually have more to see from these great talents in their county jersey. And I'm starting to feel now it's a little bit of a shame that there isn't a, a back door, uh, should Tipperary or, or Cork or Galway even go out early in their in their provincial championships. Yeah, like, I, I have to say, when the idea of a split season came through, um, you know, I was like everybody else and just assuming that it would be inter-county first and club second, but... Um, like this way has worked, you know. I know Dean Rock spoke to, uh, spoke after the game yesterday, and he said that he never enjoyed, um, you know, a couple of months as much in his football because, you know, players weren't just being given the chance to train with their clubs; they were being given the chance to train exclusively with their clubs, um, without the sort of, you know, the kind of silent pressure that comes from a county manager. Like, like that that April thing was an absolute disaster, you know, the club month because what happened in the last couple of years was, you know particularly in Hurlem, the round robin was starting in May. So you had players that were training with their counties and playing with their clubs and trying to do both. And coming, and you could just tell it was too much pressure on players. But for players, I think this is actually probably the best way. Um, and for us as kind of, you know, spectators and, you know, people who who, who watch these things and analyse them, the, the club championships now, have, have like they almost have a greater sort of, I don't know, they're kind of elevated now because you're seeing a true sense of the teams and you're seeing a true reflection of those players. Um, and, and, you know, and that's what you need for a good club championship. Like, there's no point in going to Parnell Park to watch Ballymun and all their stars if all their stars um, are out on their feet, you know. So, like, we got to see the proper proper true sense of Ballymun over the weekend. Um, and I think that's probably the same in all those... in the, in practically every other county now in Ireland. So I think there's a lot to be said for the scheduling of having the club championship first, albeit I don't fancy being the person who has to put the put the calendar together. Well, look, I, that's kind of the question I was asking earlier on. Like, that, that's the... If, if you have your um, inter-provincial club quickly, if you can do that in six weeks, then you might be able to start your club in February and finish it on the August bank holiday weekend and then the inter-county season starts, it's when that would finish and how long you'd need for that. That's the bit that um, everybody's going to struggle with because ultimately you're going to have all the finals in October or November and then you're at the... Uh, maybe under lights. Stick a, roof on, stick a roof on one of the stadiums would be grand. Yeah, the other thing as well, I, like I know people have a lot of romantic visions about the club championship because of um, you know how it happened this year. But you have to remember as well, if you you know if you have a club championship during the summer, um, like you know you'll have a lot of club in a normal season. I think a lot of club players will 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 go away. Um, maybe, and maybe and the other thing is maybe. the other thing as well, just from my point of view, is I think the GA needs to have particularly over the next few years because they're in a much more uncertain position. I think. Um, than all the other big sporting bodies in Ireland um, because of how sort of much the revenue stream is dependent on a very small number of matches. I think the GA needs to have as much exposure as possible at the highest summer months. Um, and the club championships, as great as they were, particularly when we get to the back end and we're sitting here talking about you know great county finals and great teams and great players, they tend to go under the kind of the public radar for an awful lot of that mm -hmm. uh, and we only ever get three or four weeks where they become big news um, and I, I'm not sure the GA would be ready yet to, to hand over those sort of peak summer months to the club championships and, and, and for them to kind of keep the ship afloat because you know you know the inter-county game is still where people are, get, are, are most attracted to like even our conversation this morning about county finals inevitably turned it's towards the prism of the how this yeah. is going to impact yeah. yeah how this is going to impact the inter-county thing so yeah by all means shorten it by all means give the clubs a proper window but I think um, you know you have to be you have to be careful what you wish for here well could too. you finish the club season by mid-June and then have July, August, September October 
be your inter-county and then everybody has a couple of months off. Yeah, yeah I mean, you plausibly could do, but I, I still think, you know, in, in this situation, for all the upheaval that's going to come about uh, with a split season and the GAA calendar, um, you know, I mean, I think you can only really have one revolution at a time, particularly in an organisation like the GAA. Um, and I, 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 you know, giving clubs a defined and, and a proper calendar, I think, is the right way. To, and the other thing as well is, like, let's be honest about this. If the All Ireland Finals take place on the last week in July, that means that most clubs, club championships, will be ready to go by the middle of June. So, like, you are giving club championships, um, a great window. you know, prime prime yeah. summer months. You know, like players can't moan about not having a proper program, and then by the time those club championships start coming towards this kind of crescendo at the back end of it, we won't have any more inter county, and they will sort of they will get the limelight. And I think that's probably the most pragmatic way to go about it. And I think if there's anything that will inform the GA's decision-making over the next uh, few months, it's uh, pragmatism. All right, Conor, great stuff. Great to have you with us. Thanks a million. That's Cheers, lad. Conor McKeown, you can read his work in the Indo and the Herald.